Hi, Megan. Hi. So nice to see you. Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you for doing this interview. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm just going to read out your, your bio that you sent me. Okay, Megan Majeski's narrative work tells stories from her dreams, experiences, and memories. She focuses on capturing the shadows in her unconscious and bringing them to life through symbolism and the haunting figures in her paintings. Her recent work explores the fragile beauty of life and death while fixated by symbolism from cryptological communication through the use of flowers. Her art has been featured all over the world, and she's been a golden artist educator since 2016. With a background in animation, working on movies and TV shows, she now creates art full-time from her art studio in Vancouver, Canada at the Arts Factory. Yes. Could you describe your artwork to me? So my artwork, I find that I'm really drawn to dark and tragic images, but I'm also attracted to very beautiful things. So I like to combine the two and create that contrast with my work. So it both draws you in and pushes you away. In your bio, you use the word cryptological communication. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? In my recent series, I've been researching a lot about flowers and the language of flowers and the secret meanings behind flowers. And there's so many different meanings depending on where you look. So I've looked into from Victorian times where people would give each other bouquets to sort of speak to each other in ways that they couldn't in that time. So send secret messages to each other. Um, flowers have different meanings in mythology. Um, I even researched the meanings of flowers based on their properties as well. So you can have a beautiful, delicate flower that's very common in most people's gardens, but it can be poisonous. So it almost has like this dark secret to it. Whenever I look at your work, there's completely this, um, you know, whether it's the pop cultural stuff that you're using imagery or um, young, beautiful women that are either looking like they've either died or um, are in some kind of situation that is uh, hor horrible or scary or it feels like you're always dealing with that push-pull and what's kind of in between life and death. Some people look at my work and they just see the darkness and they're quite horrified and some people just see the beauty and it's interesting seeing different people's take on the same work and it, I wonder if it says something about those people too. Well, of course, I think once you've finished a piece of work and it goes out into the world, it then automatically becomes kind of the audiences then to interpret. Um, what kind of materials do you use? I use mostly acrylic and I paint on wood panels. That's usually my final pieces. I do play with a lot of different mediums though. If I'm traveling, I always have watercolor gouache with me. So I find it really easy to take and travel with. But in my studio, I find acrylic is very versatile for what I want to do. I can get a lot of different effects with it. So that's my preferred medium of choice. So I find with acrylic, I can make it look like so many other different paints. Depending on what I use, I've made some acrylics look like gouache. I've made it look like oil paintings. I've made it look like watercolor. So I can take all of those different looks and effects and put it into one acrylic painting instead of having to choose one or the other medium. In your, uh, a lot of your other work, you, you've used um, pop cultural images. So mm -hmm. you've used My Little Pony, Fraggles, Cereal. I do them sort of in between some of my very concept heavy and technique heavy pieces that can take months and months to work on. So sometimes I'm like, I need a little break. I wanna do something kind of cute and fun. So I'm pulling from my childhood. Um, and taking a lot of the cartoon characters that bring back memories to me and kind of taking my own weird dark spin on them. So it's kind of like a fun little break in between. So then I have the energy to go back and be like, okay, now I can focus on doing another piece that's going to take me months. You're a, a golden art, artist educator. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell me what that is and also um, 
maybe tell me like why you ended up doing it and how it, how it helps your practice, your art practice. Yeah. So uh, I became a golden artist educator a few years ago. It was a process you have to go to through. You have to apply for it. And then you go through a, an intensive training in New Orleans with them. And then you have to become certified with them. Um, it's changed my art practice a huge amount. I, for painting, I'm basically self-taught. I never went to art school. I went to film school instead because it was the safer route to go. So any painting technique or anything I know about paint has been self-taught. So as well as being able to teach people so much, there's so many paint that so much different types of uh, mediums that I didn't really know about before. So even if I don't use it in my practice, I know a lot about it that I can teach other people how to and give them tips on how to use different things. So it's definitely changed my art practice and my teaching as well, knowing so much about the products, like my own little art school that I've gone to. And sorry, how long did it take you to do that? Four day, super intensive training. And then you come back, then when you get home, you have to do an online test just to make sure that you know what you're talking about to become certified. So is that one way that you've been able, like, is that one way uh, in terms of income stream that you've been able to like create a life and, and, and make a living as an artist? Yeah, definitely. I teach a lot around Vancouver or if I'm traveling, um, I usually try and set up a couple workshops and demos. I know that you've been working on a project for the last couple of years that has to do with forest fires and it's being launched in the next little while. Can you tell me about that new project? Yeah, so it's a project I've been working on for quite a few years. And I've teamed up with a writer, Sharon Roberts, and we're working together to sort of change perception on forest fires and show some of the beauty that can come out of forest fires when they're managed well, because they're actually a very natural part of nature. They need to happen. so. She's focusing on telling stories of the people affected by forest fires, and I'm focusing more on telling the stories of the plants and the flowers and the trees. So we visited places that we both grew up in. So she grew up in the Okanagan, and I grew up in the Kootenays in BC. And we went to several different places that were hit by forest fires in very different degrees of burns that they've uh, suffered. So seeing some healthy forest fires and the aftermath and some that are unhealthy and seeing the stark contrast between the two. So we went to some places where it's just black, total blackness and nothing is, things are struggling to grow back and push through the earth that's just been destroyed. And then other areas that are, you still have the black trees, but then it's just meadows and meadows of flowers and it's so beautiful. And I'm just trying to, speak for the speak for the forest in my art pieces so i'm celebrating the flowers that really thrive off the destruction and come back as well as speaking for the forests that are struggling so i also when visiting those places i gathered charcoal from the birch trees that i saw and then i brought that back to my studio and i've ground it up to make pigment or i've ground it up to make pigment that i've added into the paintings as sort of like a tribute to the forests so that we'll remember them long after they're gone and they've been used to feed the next life cycle of plants and flowers. Oh, that's so nice. And it totally uh, fits into your other work, except it's a completely different topic, the forest, but sticking yet to the themes uh, that you've looked at in the Poetry of Flowers or your nostalgic series of life cycle, regeneration, beauty and chaos and death. Uh, forest fires are a timely subject matter in that they're on the rise due to climate change, and yet they are an important, crucial step in forest regeneration. Okay, so Megan, will you dig deeper into one of your pieces? Um, give me the title and explain to me um, what's going on in the content and then maybe how you made it. Yes, so I'm going to talk about the piece right here behind me. The title of the piece is Death in the Garden. So I'm going to talk quickly about the process of it just to show how intense making a painting like that can be. So I spend usually a couple months before uh, researching the concepts, putting together ideas, getting um, inspiration. From there, I work with a model of photographer. 
I take get reference photos and then from that I do color concepts on the piece make sure I'm happy with it the process of painting the final piece I start with like a grisaille and then when I'm happy I do a couple like quite a few layers of glazes and um, washes on the piece probably probably like 100 layers on that painting wow. and slowly like putting in splashes of water, small little details, and kind of building it up to the point where I'm happy with it. The concept behind the piece, I was using flowers to sort of help convey some of the meanings in it. I find that a painting is one image but tells such a huge story. So wherever I can take little things to put in to help uh, tell more of the story. I find it really helpful. The series itself, I was working with themes of life and death and tragedy and beauty and reincarnation. So for that piece in particular, um, it looks, you can kind of see she's wrapped in sort of a plastic sheet. So it kind of makes you think like this doesn't seem, it seems like a very tragic death. Possibly it's kind of a little bit more ominous. So I'm also using the flowers as they're kind of using her body as they're feeding off her body to kind of grow this beautiful flower sort of like a reincarnation when you look at it in person it's got a lot of depth uh there's this smoky at atmospheric quality to it that does really convey the layers that you put into it um and and the and there's a delicateness to the the lines and the strokes of, of the brush um, it's a really really beautiful painting and it and it does contrast nicely with the content as well. What advice would you give your younger self about being an artist that you, you wish you had had? I wish that when I was a younger artist, I would have loosened up a lot more and played around and experimented. I found that I, even when I was younger, I was very, uh, very technical, trying to do perfect things perfectly, perfect detail, and I didn't experiment as much as I wanted to. And I'm finding now painting for so long, I'm experimenting more now and I'm learning so much. And you never know what you'll learn from just playing around with something and painting maybe a slightly different way or trying to paint something that you normally wouldn't. Sometimes if you work on being so perfect, your pieces can be so tight that they lose their life. Love it. That's a great, yeah. really great tip. Um, so what, would you please assign us an art prompt? Um, because we want to, <laughs> we want to play along with you. So yes. Let, let us know. <laughs> yes. So a lot of pieces that I've done, I've sort of done these weird cross sections in animals or in character, like cartoon characters. So I want everyone to take either an animal or a cartoon character, cut it open so you can see what's inside. And be very creative with that process. Don't just think, think sort of outside the box. Maybe, maybe it's what the animal eats. Maybe it ha relates to the animal in some way. So I've cut open an owl and I have like a little nest with eggs in it, or I've taken um, some cartoon characters from my childhood, like Toucan Sam, and I cut him open. He's got Fruit Loops in him. So like really have fun. And you can't really go wrong with what is inside that character. So Megan, where yeah. do we find you online and in Vancouver? Um, and where might we be able to see your fire, uh, the force fire pieces um, yeah. once they're up? So you can find my work on my website, deadkitty.com. It's the same with on Instagram. Um, the fire exhibit, it's gonna be at the BD Biodiversity Museum at the University of British Columbia. Uh, once there's either an online um, preview or if you can actually see it in person, I'll have it on my social media so people can see it either in person or get a little preview online. We will definitely check you out on, um, on your sites and on Instagram. And thank you so, so much for thank doing you. this interview with me today. Yeah.